Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News Weekend. A member of the Thunder Bay Police Services Board, who is also a former chief of the nearby First Nation, says the department is on the brink of collapse and that it's due to leadership issues. Our reporter Daryl Stranger has the details. George Ann Morisot says her time on the Thunder Bay Police Services Board has been appalling and disheartening. She released an open letter this week saying there have been improper investigations, tactics of harassment and discrimination by Thunder Bay Police, and failure to put in an effective governance structure despite two independent reports stating they had a leadership problem. Today at a press conference, Morisot discussed the letter. They are on the, the brink of class because there's no leadership, there's no systemic remedies, there's no systemic reform and change or anything there to empower the members of the service to be their best and do their best, which then has a significant impact out in the city, out in our community. It impacts the service delivery. More so filed a human rights complaint in October 2021 against members of the Thunder Bay Police Services Board, the Chief of Police and Senior Management. Two separate reports have been done about the Thunder Bay Police Services Board and the Thunder Bay Police Service, one by the Office of the Independent Police Review Director and another by Senator Murray Sinclair. Both found that systemic racism exists within the force. The Thunder Bay Police Services Board and Thunder Bay Chief of Police deny there are any problems. The board, together with the Thunder Bay Police Service, is working to provide the policing that our communities expect and deserve. In addition, we'd like to add that the board, with the exception of Member Morso, is united, working well, and far from collapse. I would like to echo the words of the Thunder Bay Police Service's board. We are working together to provide a high level of policing which the community has come to expect. Morriso, the former chief of Fort William First Nation, joined the board in 2019, but says clear change has not come. Other members of the Thunder Bay Police Service have also filed human rights complaints, which lawyer Chantel Bryson says is unprecedented. It is extraordinary, after 20 years of practice, to see any member of a police force publicly file against its leadership and board. And it is beyond extraordinary to have 11 file against the police leadership and the board, as well as numerous others wishing to file but precluded from doing so due to a time limitation. Bryson hopes the human rights complaints can lead to positive change in the future. Every single complainant, as well as the six I turned away, um, only and foremost wants appropriate systemic remedies to ensure a safe and healthy workplace for officers so that officers can do their job and also be well when they go home to their families. And, and I think the addition for Member Morriso, um, and I've known and worked with Member Morriso for a very long time, and she is always squarely focused on transparency and accountability in the public realm. In a bizarre twist towards the end of the press conference, an unknown source took over the feed and started playing adult videos. The conference was then shut down. Daryl Stranger, APTN National News, Winnipeg. Also during that press conference in Thunder Bay, a user named T-Bay Police was overheard while unmuted discussing putting a fake name to represent their Zoom account. It's not clear if that was uh, members of the Thunder Bay Police Service, but a spokesperson for Thunder Bay Police says the matter is being looked into. Well, it was a busy day on Thursday in Ottawa. The federal government signed a new agreement with the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation to release more residential school records. And that same afternoon, they announced additional funding to help First Nations communities fight COVID's Omicron variant. APTN's Fraser Needham reports. The information from these records will help in all stages of truth, reconciliation and healing. That's Executive Director for the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, Stephanie Scott. Thursday, the government committed to releasing more but not all residential school records to her organization. However, Crown Indigenous Relations Minister Mark Miller was quick to point out it isn't as simple as handing over all records for public view. I mean, today we're talking about um, effectively 11 school narratives. Um, a school narrative may seem like a very simple thing. It isn't. 
Um, it can be school uh, enrollment and names. It can have various levels of information. Uh, the Kamloops one is rather extensive. I wouldn't pretend it to be complete, uh, but that is one of the ones being transferred today. Yeah. The government also announced $125 million in new funding to help First Nations fight Omicron. At the same time, one of Canada's chief medical officers of public health says he has reason to be hopeful. You know, day after day over the past week, we are seeing, uh, you know, the number of cases uh, flattening, you know, at around, you know, 5,000, you know, to 6,000 range. The government also says First Nations are in need of enhanced mental health supports because of COVID's fourth wave. Fraser Needham, AP10 National News, Ottawa. Time for a quick break. Coming up, a two-part series on what is lost for one Cree man in an effort to make way for resource development. Stick around. Welcome back. A northwestern Quebec mining project in Cree territory has the potential to create hundreds of jobs, but it will cost at least one Cree man his family trap line. And there is the potential for many more mining projects to come. Here's the first of a two-part series by Shushan Bacon, translated by Tom Fenario. Whoa. Ah, door. This is the sort of knowledge you can't learn in school. Trapping animals is best taught on the land through observation, practice, and experimentation. That's how Ernie Moses learned. Now, he's the one doing the teaching. No, you have to get... Oh, Peter, oh, Peter. Turn this thing around. Moses is what the Cree call a tally man. He oversees his family's trap line, located near the Cree First Nation of East Maine in the James Bay region of Quebec. His favorite animal to trap? The beaver. He knows his territory like the back of his hand. As tally man, he concerns himself with everything around here. These days, he worries more than usual. His trap line falls on land earmarked for the future Rose Lithium Tantal Mining Project. The project is located in the traditional lands of the Cree Nation of East Main. Set to be built by the Critical Elements Corporation, the mine will last for 26 years and is expected to produce 4,500 tons of minerals per day. There are advantages also au niveau des contrats, the government formation. It will create hundreds of jobs, but two lakes will be drained. Environment Canada has approved the project, saying that there will be a minimal amount of environmental impact. Moses is about to get on a helicopter with a biologist hired by the mining company. Their mission is to do an inventory of the beaver population from the sky. From up high, he is able to see the land he is on the verge of losing, the land that served as his university, where his grandmother, Eliza Moses, taught him everything about how to live on the land they call Iwichti, which translates as people's land. I adopted my grandma when I was À l'âge de deux ans. Puis, euh, c'est que c'est comme ma, ma mère, je l'ai adoptée. C'est elle qui m'a montré tout. C'est comment, comment vivre dans le bout. Oui, mais non, oui, mais si. petits. Now it's Moses' turn to teach the younger members of his family how and where to install beaver traps. On this day, his grandson and cousin are on the receiving end of his instruction. I want to teach them the way uh, my, uh, my grandmother, my uncles, teach me. I want them to learn their uh, traditional life. 
The Grand Council of the Cree, as well as the Cree Nation of East Maine, signed an agreement in July 2019 with Critical Elements Corporation for the Rose Tantal Mine. The Cree stand to gain construction contracts, training for jobs, and an undisclosed amount of money. I believe that the Cree Nation is a model of, you know, what you can really bring to the table if you have a willingness to move forward in, in partnership. Grand Chief of the Cree government, Mandy Galmasti, affirms that Cree leaders are determined to walk the line between economic development and land preservation. For me, the maître de trap is very important. My grandparents were the maître de trap. They have lived all their lives on their trap line. I understand the importance of knowing if a project touches someone at this level. I can't do it. I don't know. Back in the territory, the feelings of peace and freedom that Ernie Moses' 17-year-old grandson feels when he's on the land aren't something that can be bought or sold, but they are certainly something that can be lost. We can't go hunting over there for about 20, 25 or 20 years, about around there. So they're blocking us from hunting in our trap line. So I don't think there's anything we could do about that. In the next part of the series, we will examine some of the benefits to the Cree Nation from increased mining on their land. One inch, okay, from the ground. And find out if the Moses family will succeed in catching any beavers during what might be one of their last trapping seasons on this land. A story by Shoshan Bacon, APTN National News, Cree Territory at EUHG in Quebec. Economic development versus land preservation. As many Indigenous people in Canada know, it's a balance that is difficult to achieve, especially when the land is tied to a traditional way of life. Here now is part two of Shushan Bacon's series on lithium mining in Cree territory, translated and read by Tom Fenario. Randy Wischi and the Moses family are putting the final touches to this beaver trap, but setting the trap is only part of it. Knowing the exact location of where to put it is essential. One inch, okay, from the ground. Having done that, it needs to be left overnight. And if everything goes according to plan, come the morning, there will be what the Cree call an umps or beaver in the trap. Now you give it to the woman. <laughs> Ernie Moses is what the Cree call a tally man, which means he spends a lot of time outside looking after his family's trap line. There's not much else in the world he'd rather be doing. Come there, that bank over. The wild nature que j'aime. Puis uh, le trappage, puis la chasse aux ornies, puis aussi des collets, puis tout là, tu sais. But it's not only beavers who make dams around Moses' trap line. 2002 saw Hydro Quebec build the East Main One hydroelectric dam. Over 600 square kilometers were flooded, creating a vast reservoir. The dam was built after Quebec signed the Pays de Brave Agreement with the Cree. We are no longer bystanders uh, where we are watching the benefits of development go south. This is wrong. Not everybody was happy at the time. All the Waskaganish people help me. But the majority voted in favor of the East Main project for the jobs it would create, despite the environmental costs. A memorial plaque keeps watch over the flooded lands. It remembers the ancestors who hunted here, whose remains are underwater, who for countless generations made their home along the East Main River and nearby lands, lakes and rivers. Who, the memorial says, sacrificed for the Cree Nation. What I wish to do. Now, it appears it's Moses' turn to sacrifice. Critical Elements is proud to present its lithium and tantalum mining project. Plans are underway for an open pit mine to be built on its trap line. The 
The land here is rich with lithium and other rare earth metals. Three mining projects, all within driving distance of Ernie's trap line alone, are worth billions of dollars over the next few decades. <laughs> it's looking like for the Cree in Quebec, mining is becoming the new hydroelectricity. In February of 2020, Quebec and the Cree signed the Grand Alliance, a $4.7 billion proposal to improve infrastructure for mining, such as the building of railroads and a deep water port in Hudson's Bay. La Grande Alliance est un dossier qui était lancé en dessous euh, l'ancien grand chef, M. Abel Bosom. Il y avait une vision de vraiment comprendre comment on pourrait diriger le développement économique dans notre territoire. Je trouve que c'est essentiel. Il y a un beau partnership, nation en nation, avec le gouvernement de Québec. Puis, tu sais, nous autres, on se demande qu'est-ce qui va sortir de ce dossier-là. On est en train de faire les études de feasibility study, mais on est vraiment euh, dans le beginning là, de ce dossier-là. Back on Ernie's trap line, the Rose Lithium Tantal open pit mine is expected to produce 4,500 tons of minerals a day. Environmentalists say the mining of lithium and other rare earth minerals is bad for waterways. But according to geologist Michel de Gebrec, that depends. In the case of the Rose Lithium mine, he expects there to be little long-term effects because there is a lack of toxic minerals in the ground that will leach into the waterways. Gebrac also explains that minerals like lithium and tantalum are essential for electric vehicles and other aspects of modern life. Il y a 20 ans, le téléphone portable, c'était une espèce de grosse boîte comme ça, là, un truc très très lourd qu'il fallait se balader. Et puis il y a quelqu'un qui a eu l'idée de mettre un petit peu de tantal dedans, un condensateur au tantal, ce qui fait que le téléphone, <laughs> il est rentré dans quelque chose qu'on peut rentrer dans sa poche. Donc. The mine is being created in collaboration with the Cree nations of East Maine and Namaska. Training and jobs for them are part of the agreement. The objective is to begin construction this summer. Le projet, oui, c'est un, c'est un projet d'une génération, mais il y a d'autres générations par la suite. Donc, d'avoir des, des, des sociétés, des compagnies qui vont se développer à long terme, puis qui peuvent bénéficier pas juste pour une communauté, mais qui peuvent bénéficier à différentes communautés, euh, c'est très important pour nous aussi. Là. Moses says he understands that the mine will financially benefit the Cree for generations. But that doesn't mean he approves. Because not much can get between the love Italian man has for his trap line. To me, it's uh, it's really hurts, but I don't know what to say. Other things and all this, you know, it's only my my trap line. I'm thinking I'm thinking about a story by Shushan Bacon, APTN National News, Cree Territory of EUHG in Quebec. What a great series. We've got another story on traditional practices coming up after the break. Welcome back to APTN National News Weekend. Well, they are known as the Quill Sisters, three Mi'kmaq women who use porcupine quills to create traditional Mi'kmaq art. Their passion for quilling has resulted in a podcast. And for the first time, their art will be a main installation at a gallery in Halifax. Angel Moore reports. For Cheryl Simon, quilling is more than art. It connects her to her ancestors and culture. We're often thinking about our ancestors and our grandmothers who were making quill work to sell to settlers. And we, we've been thinking a lot about if they had been making art to be creative as opposed to survive and to make money to get by with their families, how would the art have formed? Pulling the porcupine quills through birch bark is not as easy as it looks. The quills are razor sharp, but not easy to come by. Simon of Abiguet First Nation in Prince Edward Island now lives in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, and has to get her porcupine quills from roadkill. Simon shares the quills with her friends, Kay Sark and Melissa Peter Paul. They both live in Prince Edward Island, where there are no porcupines. They also co-host a podcast called The Quill Sisters. Welcome to Ebiquit Quill Sisters, where Mi'kmaq porcupine quill workers share the stories behind their art. The bi-weekly podcast was launched in May 2021.
The podcast is really wanting to share people the cultural knowledge and experiences and the components of who we are as Mi'kmaq women that goes into our art and really highlight for people all of the stories and the lessons about quill work that Mi'kmaq people have never been able to share before. Simon quilled these petroglyph images, Mi'kmaq carvings on rocks over 13,000 years old. So this piece here actually represents, if you see, it's the water, you know, with the whales in the water, people uh, fishing, and then the land animals, birds, and then up to space with, um, with, with the sun. So it's basically all levels of, of being. And Simon's favorite piece is called the Indian Act. It depicts broken pieces of the Mi'kmaq star to express the damages done to indigenous identity by the act. And then one piece is for the people that, like the 60 scoop, that were taken away from the nation and they feel hollow and lost and small. The Mary E. Black Gallery is near Halifax's waterfront. For the first time, the Quill Sisters art will be on display. Simon consulted with Mi'kmaq curator Aidan Gillis. He creates spaces to welcome Indigenous people. I find the Indigenous community often feels when they go into museums is that they're talking about us to someone else and it never feels like a yeah, space is ever made with us in mind, you know, and so there's that beauty in trying to be inclusive, but we are feeling alienated no matter where we are despite being on our own territory. The installation is called Mateus Revisited. Mateus is Mi'kmaq for porcupine. Gillis says quilling represents the past and the present. Where I really do see Indigenous artists as historians because the, the amount of research that goes into so many of this work um, and, and the way that artists have a way of, of, of summarizing that and putting that out into a moment, you know, for people can really help them see the world and, and in a different way, really. Simon is putting the final touches to her piece. Sark's art will be hung on the wall. Meanwhile, Peter Paul's art is still in transit from PEI. We're really excited to have such a unique exhibit where it's Mi'kmaq people on Mi'kmaq territory displaying Mi'kmaq quill work. Mateus Revisited will be on display January 21st till March 13th. Angel Moore, APTN National News, Jabuktuk, also known as Halifax. Truly incredible work. Well, that is all the time we have for your APTN National News this weekend. Of course, you can find news anytime by visiting our website, aptnnews.ca. I'm Dennis Ward. Thanks so much for being with us. Enjoy the rest of your weekend.